I know many of us at our tables are still being served, but it is past time to get started with our program. I want to give you a reminder, we do first Thursday of every month webinars. We have a fundraising basics scheduled at Lenore Ryan at 8.30 a.m. on February 5th. And more information will come out to your inbox about that. It's $10. They are fantastic, not to be missed. This particular topic ties in very well with what you're about to hear. Next month's monthly luncheon, again, one not to be missed, Ann Manor McClarty is going to be joining us from Curista. She's here locally. She has been doing some fantastic work in the world of donor stewardship and recognition that has been replicated nationally. So she's gonna join us with a must be at luncheon on February 18th. And the reason you all are here is to learn about your annual planning, how to do it, what works best for your organization and size, with realistic expectations. And there is no one better to do that today than Alex Comfort. He has almost 30 years in fundraising. He's the president of Mountain Nonprofit Solutions. And my dear friend, so I'm so excited to introduce him to you all. Okay, thanks, folks. What we're gonna we're gonna uh, do this a little different today because we have a lot of people here, and so we are uh, uh, gonna kind of talk while you all are eating. Now, this means that I may have to let you know when I tell a joke because if you don't <laughs> laugh at my jokes, then I get very discouraged, and we don't want that. So the first thing we have to do today. Now, this is a really official thing. Uh, that I would like everybody to do, if you will, please pull out your cell phones and your various devices, check your blessed email, and then turn it off. Okay? If you got anything that's really hot, you, we're going to have a prize for the first person that runs out of the room with a hot problem at the back of work. Okay? So anyway, that's uh, uh, just a uh, reminder. Please let's uh, let's try and do this without too much of that. Now, everybody should be getting some materials. If you don't have any materials, uh, I'm not sure what to do because we, I think I've got a few more copies up here. Now you've got basically three sheets from me. Um, one is a, uh, a colored, got some color stuff on it, and then there are two sheets. The first one is sort of an outline of what I'm going to do, and it's got an old school statement at the bottom. It's called notes. Now for you young people, in the old days, we would go to a talk and we would actually write something down if we heard something that was helpful, all right? It was called taking notes. There, and some of us old people remember that. But anyway, I wanted to make sure you understood what I was talking about. Now, uh, my first statement is that um, I've got, a, I've got a sheet that says how to design your annual fundraising plan. That's what we're going to be talking about today. But I'm going to spend a few minutes on some preliminaries to that. Because one of the things that I've found is that people really don't do the preliminaries. Let's presume that you're finished with your highly successful year in fundraising and you or your boss or somebody says, okay, it's time to plan for the next year. All right. Now I want to sh I want a show of hands. How many of you have currently a written fundraising plan that guides your organization? All right. A lot of hands going up. How many of you do not? How many of you do not have a written fundraising? No, 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 no. Keep the hands up in the air. I need to see them, Holly. All right. See, that's what happened. Okay, so we've got a few people that have it. There are, there are. Uh, when I look back at my career, there, are, there are a number of times when I didn't actually have a fundraising plan because the truth is it was all sort of up in my head anyway and nobody else cared. Now this is the next thing and please I'd like this to be somewhat interactive even though your mouths are full of food so watch out for the people across the table but anyway who is your fundraising plan written for besides yourself? Somebody call out. The board. The board. Yay for the board. Who else? The boss. The who? Okay, the, the, the service providers. Interesting comment. Donors. 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 Executive director. Yeah. Executive director. Thank you very much. Or is there anybody else? Maybe volunteers? All right, now, now already we've had a couple of comments that are rather surprising. 
somebody writes their annual fundraising plan for the other staff members in the agency to see. Is that right, Gene? Is that what you said? Okay, what do you do with it? Rebecca, what do you do with it? It allows them to uh, help us kind of reach, reach some of our goals as connectors. Okay, so the first plan, the first point I'd like to make is that many of you may not have given enough attention to teaching your staff members what you do. Will Cunningham is rather new into the fundraising role, and everybody working at the rescue mission thinks Will is not out. Will is now out every day schmoozing and having big fancy lunches and parties with everybody around town. Is that right, Will? All right. And they are giving him a hard time, I'm sure, back at the rescue mission about this, right? Okay, so uh, we can make fun of this, but there really is some truth here. And the truth is that your staff are your fundraisers as much as you are. If you've got the world's grumpiest person as your rece receptionist, and you go in and, these, and your donors come in to see you, and they meet Mr. or Miss Grumpy first, it is really going to knock down your effectiveness. So I'm making fun of this, but one of the things that is important for you to do as a fundraiser is figure out a way, and they're going to resist, but figure out a way to get your staff members in some a series of groups or in one group and tell them what fundraising is and how it works and how many times you have to be nice to a donor. Because they've got They've got a tough job, they've got stress on them, and you're literally asking them to help you do your job. So, believe it or not, it's a major thing for everybody to do. Now, there are a couple of other things that, uh, that I'd say to you first. Number one is, why do I bother to have an annual plan? Well, I'm going to answer this by, by just reflecting back that a number of people uh, have just said that we've got a whole lot of people who need to know what we do. And you know what? Somebody said the board first. They're some of the people who know the least about what you really do. And even though they've been through orientation, they listen to your reports at meetings, they don't know what you do. And they might not really care. Okay? So let's, let's be honest about that. But if you're going to do your job, you need those board members uh, to help you as much as it's possible. All right, now I'm going to say something that is cynical, and those of you that know me well know that this is an area that I get into that I'm really good at, but uh, my cynical statement to you is, today, I want each of you to think about all the support you have. Your executive director, the board members, your donors, and that kind of thing. And I'm going to tell you that every now and then you're going to find out, painfully, that you don't have quite as much support as you think you have. There may be somebody on that board, or maybe even your executive director, who is secretly saying, I'm not sure that person is really working all that hard. I mean, I looked in there the last week, and I didn't see that development director at his desk more than a couple of days. Well, you got some work to do if your executive director is saying that, obviously. But one of the things I would like you to keep in mind is you are preparing this report for a constituency that you want to see it. And that means that you're going to have to show it to them and explain it to them. And again, they may not particularly want to hear it. All right. So, uh, the, the, I got s some steps that I would like you to take before you start doing your plan. And the first one is to sit down with at least and, and I hope you've got a development committee on your board. Wilson Sims did a, uh, a talk last summer at PI on do we still need a development committee? I was talking somewhere else, so I couldn't hear. Was he for it or against it? Anybody remember? For it, he, okay, so he's still for having a development committee. All right, go to Wilson if you want to find out his different version. I'm sure it's helpful. But, but I would say I don't care if you've only got one member on your board that will really be a development committee. The one thing you must repeat, must repeat, must never do or allow is have the board chair say, well, development is everybody's responsibility, so we're going to have a committee of the whole. All right? That, that ensures that nobody's going to do anything. 
So even if it's only one member, get a development committee, get that development person to sit down with you and analyze what happened last year. All right? And that means you've got to look at what happened last year and be really careful to say, this worked, this other thing didn't work. You're going to look at your entire program. So, analyze what happened last year. Now, back at your office, in somebody's bookcase, back in the corner with this dust on it, is something called, Debbie, you know what it is? Strategic your strategic plan. <laughs> there it is, back there in the corner. We did that two years ago. It was great. We got everybody together, and we got we, we paid big bucks to a consultant to come in and tell us what to do. And we, we worked and worked and worked, and he wrote this report, and we stuck it in the corner. Take that sucker out and look at it. You might find something in it that will give you some hint about what you might want to plan next year. Okay? Seriously. Number three, how many of you at least once a year do a walk around? Does anybody know what a walk around is? Okay, a walk around is where you and your CEO and the chair of your board, the three of you, walk around your facility. As in, you walk around the building, you look at the signs out, out front, you look at the way the grass looks, you look at all those strange fences they have over there at the Red Cross, I've never understood that. But anyway, you look at all that stuff. Now those of you that are working out of the, you know, 50 South French Broad, you know, you may not need to do this as much, but you look at all the facilities because you need to know what it looks like. Folks, if your nonprofit looks like a second-rate operation, your donors are going to give to you as if you're a second-rate operation. So walk around and see what you've got. Look at it from a donor's eye. Bring the chair of the board or that, you know, some of my comments today, you know those board members that won't help you? All right, well, you can, they can, you can get them to help you with this stuff. Have them walk around with you and just look at what everything looks like because you may find out some things that are a priority that you didn't realize. Okay, remember, you're still getting ready to write your report. All right, now I also want you, as part of your walk around, to lay out all your materials. You know those brochures you have? You know that wonderful website you just, get it on the computer all up, lay it all out in a room, and your little team of three is gonna go and look over your materials. Do your materials really reflect the kind of organization you have? My Duke University alumni magazine arrives quarterly. I'm, I'm very impressed with this piece. It's about 60 to 80 pages long, four color, full glossy, the most opulent thing in the world. It suits them. That's fine. You and I wouldn't send that out to our board members or as an annual report because it's too fancy. And so whatever your level of fancy is, your materials should say the same thing to your donors. Sometimes it, it could be too fancy, other times it's not, it's not professional enough. But be sure that you look at things with an eye toward, is, are my donors going to say, this makes sense for us? So look at your materials, look at your website, look at your social media stuff, look at it all as part of your preliminary to your annual plan. Because you may find some things that are very important to you to do that you don't know. All right, now here's the biggest thing I want you to do as you prepare. And that is, I want you to be able to distinguish what it is that you're, you're spending, your, you're going to raise money for your annual plan on, but mainly, do you have a good major gift project that you're going to add to your fundraising plan? The bottom line is an awful lot of charities get, get into the same process every year, and they don't realize when we talk about how to upgrade a donor, you know, which is our whole problem, Mr. and Mrs. Got Rocks have this thing that they pass through osmosis to other their other buddies with money and they and the truth is they know the difference between your annual plan and a major gift request they know that and so they may write you a check for a hundred out hundred dollars or a thousand dollars for your annual plan every year but you you're sitting there saying how do I, I upgrade them you upgrade them at least one way 
by saying, well, we need more than $1,000, that's fine and dandy, but you upgrade them by having some really important major gift thing that you're doing this year. All right, is it a capital campaign? If it is, that's a whole nother topic. But what I'm saying is, be sure beforehand that you have your major gift uh, thing that you need identified. Sit down and argue about it. What is it? Maybe you've got two of them. That may be okay, but realize that you need something else that Mr. Gottrocks can say, oh gee, I'll go back into my pocket again. This time I'm gonna write them a big check because I love what they're doing. The Black Mountain School for uh, Children has a wonderful thing on it every annual news or every newsletter they send out. It's the top 10 list of things we need. Everybody ought to have that in your, in your newsletter because you can either get an in-kind gift or maybe a spare $2,500 check to cover that, to cover one of those 10 things. It's a, it's, a, it's a variation on what I'm saying. Have some other things that your donors can get excited about because they might have the ability to do that. They may look at you and say, look, I gave you $100. I don't have any more to give you. That's okay. But remember that um, uh, Gail Perry, the consultant over in Raleigh, when she, when she keynoted PI a couple of years ago, said something that was really, really scary to most of us in the development field. She said that our problem as fundraisers is that we have the ability to fund everything we want to fund already in our donor base. That we don't need any new donors. We just need to figure out how to go to the ones we have. Does that scare you as much as it scares me? Do you want to argue with that as much as I want to argue with it? And yet the truth is, it's been very interesting when I think back to times I've been on a staff and I think about who we've got. All right, we spend a lot of tr time in trouble chasing those new dollars. But maybe they're there right now. One of the things we need is a nice major gift piece. Okay, so you have done those four things and then also with your, your thing that you come up with for your major gift uh, need, be sure you know how much it costs. All right. Now remember that particularly when you get to major gifts, most major gift donors don't like to be the one donor that funds your entire major gift thing them, yourself. All right, they want to be part of a groundswell of their peers to fund that major gift need. So it's 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 best to have something to go to uh, to a whole bunch of people about. Hopefully they're giving to your annual fund. And um, okay, so anyway, enough about that. Um, Incremental Oh, all right. Now, if you will, please look at number two on my little sheet. Those of you that have been to my fundraising boot camp know that I've told you over the years that uh, there are four major types of fundraising. Well, I've now decided to make that five. So, who are my recent graduates from last week? I got several over here. Yay, all right, you guys survived. You all know this, but the, but the truth is there's a, there's a fifth major type of fundraising. Now these five are the annual fund, major gifts, endowment gifts, plan gifts, and now what I'm gonna add, because I'm gonna call it unrelated or mission-related income. This is all co also called earned income, all right? And I, I will tell you that every one of your charities needs to be thinking about what kind of business you can go into. Do we need another thrift shop in the area? That's where a lot of the traditional earned income comes from. Maybe there's some other kind of business you need to do. I'm not saying that you're gonna come up with it quickly, but every single charity needs to be thinking about this. Does anybody know why? It has to do with my age. Rebecca said the baby boomers. The baby boom generation is twice the size of Generation X. Everybody realize this? The ba this is my generation. I'm, I'm a leading edge baby boomer, born in 48. So my generation has, or is in the process of receiving $14.4 trillion in wealth. You've heard all this, all right? And guess what we're doing with it? We're living on it. We're spending it. We're not giving it to any of you. We're not giving it to our kids. Why? Well, there's several reasons. Number one, 
We're going to all live, live so darn long that we have no idea if we're going to outlive our money. So all your older donors right now are saying, gee, I'll give you a gift, but I'm afraid I'm going to outlive my money. Or else they're thinking it and not telling you the truth. But that's part of life right now. Okay? The second thing is, even though our parents are really good at saving, we're not. Yeah, I want a new car. Let's go take a trip. Our parents didn't do this. They lived through the Depression in World War II. That's why they had that money. They're giving it to us and we're spending it. Okay, millennials and Generation Xers, what's coming to you? Not a whole lot. <laughs> so that's one thing to know right now. So that means when the baby boom generation in 20 years are all sitting in the nursing home or somebody in the family is taking over our fiscal affairs, your income, your donor income in your charity is going to drop precipitously. Baby boomers are twice as numerous as Generation Xers. And we're staying at work because we can't afford to retire. So those of you that would like our jobs, tough luck, we're not vacating them. Right? Now think about the implications of this for your nonprofit. So you better plan for it right now. Donna Ensley, what are you doing? She's starting a planned giving program. Why? Because of what I'm talking about. In 20 years, you're going to uh, wind up with a, with a huge income loss. So think about planned giving. Think about an earned income business. Now, I'm going to tell you about my life at the Cradle of Forestry in a minute, ago, in, in a minute but one of the things that I realized I had to do is I had two earned income branches, and I needed more. Remember when Scott Buchanan came and talked to us at AFP about three months ago? And he basically said, we're Care Par Partners Foundation. We don't do any fundraising. Really? Really? And yet, that's the truth. Why? Because he's done a really good job of starting earned income things. Do you pay more tax on it? Yes, you do. It's called unrelated business income tax. But they're still doing it. So I'm, I'm harping on this to say, be thinking about this as part of your annual plan, all right? Now, in your annual plan, the realize uh, what you need to realize about your annual fund is the annual fund is money that is basically unrestricted. That's why special events is included in the annual fund, all right? It's not one of the major types of fundraising. Now, I knew now I'm doing a lot of my work, consulting work in the town, in the city of Hendersonville. Hendersonville is a city of events. Right, Ruth? And there's an event all the time. And Ruth, how many do you have to go to? Uh, 2,742. 2,700. You got it. So 2,742. Welcome to Hendersonville, Jim Brewer. There you go, big guy. Okay, so, so the truth is, lots of special events over there. And your boards are going to say, oh my God, not another golf tournament. I'm sorry. They work. I play golf. I'll go play at your tournament, maybe. Depends on how much you charge. But the point is, special events basically are for unrestricted money. Most of the time, you can slip that. Or you, know, you, may have a, you may have a theme or something else. But the truth is, if it's a theme, it's going to relieve your budget because you've got to pay for that anyway. Everybody see what I'm talking about? Uh, you know, this isn't rocket science, and it's not ethical, ethically improper. What you're doing is you're trying to put a label on it that you're going to do anyway, and so you know that money goes there, and then other money goes here. This is unrestricted fundraising. It's the holy grail of what you do. All right? Why are you not out chasing every single grant there is? Because that grant may take you into a, a, an area your mission doesn't want. You, you know your mission doesn't support. It's called mission creep. You can lose a charity that way, and we're losing lots of them in the United States right now. So don't don't miss that fact. All right, so. Annual fund is your basic uh, idea of what you've got to do. Then I told, told you a minute ago about major gifts. You should have some nice little major gift thing that you do beyond uh, what, you're already, you know, what you're doing for your, your uh, annual fund. Endowment gifts are some of the hardest money you can get for a couple of reasons. Number one, donors like to do something immediate that makes them feel good. You know, you say, can I have a $10,000 gift? I'm going to stick it in my endowment. We're going to use 5% a year for annual fund. Oh, yeah, that's sexy. All right. How about letting me save a kid somewhere or uh, giving you a piece of a machine that you've got to 
got to use to, to uh, till the garden or something. That's what a major donor is going to look for. Makes endowment difficult. But anyway, you still include it. I would suggest to you that you teach your board and your donors about endowment by taking 5% of your annual fund or 5% of your, your special event and saying, we're going to put this in our endowment. Okay? Now, what happens if you've got $100 million in your endowment and your donors know about it and you come to them for a $1,000 gift? They're going to say, what? You've got $100,000, you know, whatever it is in the endowment, and I'm going to give to the Humane Society back there because uh, Luttrell's still not been able to give away all those cats. <laughs> and, and, so, uh, and so that donor, so I'm just telling you, if you had too much endowment, because the board, oh, you got to do more endowment, you got to do more endowment. What are you telling your kids? You're telling your kids you need reserves in your personal bank account for three to six months, right? Same thing's true with your charity. Beyond that, your donors are going to start saying, well, you don't need as much from me. So just understand that about endowment when you start to go raising it. Um, plan giving is a whole other thing, but plan giving is both uh, on the annual fund track and also the major gifts track. It, and, and the other thing about it is we make it too complicated. We have completely ceded the turf to the tax attorneys. And uh, we don't need to do that. We're the ones that know how to talk to donors. Let's learn how to talk plan giving in a reasonable way. Talk to me afterwards. Okay, now, uh, the, uh, the last thing I've talked about already is earned income. Okay, so I've, I've given you two examples of an annual plan. The color one, let's look at that first. The color annual plan is the annual plan from Pardee Hospital Foundation. Now, you may have this on a two-page sheet, or it might be front and back. And Kim Hinkleman uh, told me that I could use this, which was a nice thing. And uh, I really want to tell you, I think it's a wonderful plan. Now, uh, if you look at it, and I understand that originally this came from none other than our own Debbie Rice, who used to work at the Party Hospital Foundation before she forsake it for... <laughs> for profits. But anyway, um, so she developed this before she left and then dropped anchor, you know, whatever, pulled anchor and got wet left. All right, so look at it for just a minute. This is a, a development plan for calendar year 2014. All right, so let's look at annual fund. Now, there's your goal for annual fund for 2014. And the, uh, the staff member is KY, Karen Yeagerhofer, who's back there. Hello, Karen, raise your hand. And so let's look at what she's going to do. Well, in mid-March, she's going to start mailing. And, or no, I'm sorry, mid-November. Now, now uh, you know, we are, their fiscal year starts 1 October, so that's why it's, it's done this way. But she, like most of you, is going to have an end-of-the-year annual fund mailing that she sends out. All right? Then at the hospital, there's something called Doctor's Day. So they do that in March. And then in July, uh, they're going to have a mailing for their annual fund, okay? Have I, have I got that? Okay, so that's, and that's sort of their annual fund for the year. All right, now relax because they got a whole lot of other things that are annual fund that they haven't talked about yet. But anyway, the point is I'm able to see if I'm a board member what Karen's doing and when with regard to annual fund. All right, then let's look at the other things. If you go down there, she's got 40 under 40, that's 40, 40 donors under 40. Okay, 40 donors under 40. Uh, she's got the best plan for incorporating young donors of any place I've ever seen, so talk to Karen about that. I didn't know what cornhole was. I'm sorry, I just didn't know. You will. No, no, now I know. I went to a football game at the last Panthers game and I found out, my God, I've never seen anything like it. All right, so, so. What? You better be practicing. No, 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 no. My pain will be. I quit. <laughs> no, you win. Whatever. All right, so she's also got the uh, physician giving. She's got generations of excellence. And then you turn the page, she may have more stuff. All right. So all I'm saying is this is a depiction in a chart of what her goal is and when she's going to do it. So let's turn the page and look at another one. Well, look at plan giving, okay? So, so they had a major uh, work, a piece of work on plan giving, and they had a bunch of stuff to do. 
So you can see identify prospects, solicit playing gifts, educational workshop, identify more prospects, form new committees, a letter sent out in January and March and July and September. That must have been when they brought that guy in from the outside to do a plan giving consultancy with them. But uh, anyway, so, so they've got a, a full program there. You can see it on this plan. All right, now this, I would, I would tell you that Party Hospital is what I would call a mid-size shop. All right, we've got, uh, I say we because I'm, I'm in it right now with, with them. But, uh, you know, it's like eight or ten people and they do an awful lot of stuff. This is a complicated plan. And so if you look down the programs, you'll see the, ma the major gift uh, program is there, the Tournament of Champions is their golf tournament, Women Helping Women, women is a major thing that they do, the Spring Gala uh, brings in $100,000, and so you'll see that on this plan there are a lot of things listed. You've also got in the front a, a, a poll for the actual amount of fundraising, and what I would tell you is it's an excellent plan. Now I want you to stop and ask me questions about it, if anybody has any. What software did they use this in? What <laughs> software do you do, Razor's Edge? So, is it Razor's Edge? Well, the donor database is Razor's Edge, but this was actually just done in Excel. Did the Excel? Yeah. That's easy. And by the way, folks, a lot of your annual plan, the best way to do it is on Excel. I'm just going to make that statement. Uh, <laughs> you know, you want to be able to control it and really make it user friendly. And the bottom line in your annual plan is that you've got to be very creative and hit the things that you need hitting. All right. When I gave you those five types of fundraising, one of the things you're going to do in that preliminary uh, time is decide which of the five are you going to do. Are you going to do all five? You know, you're going to have a major plan giving program. When I do plan giving, when I lecture on plan giving, uh, I always ask people, do you have a plan giving program? And you know, I'll get two or three hands that go up. How many of you received a bequest? Most every hand goes up. I got to tell you, you got your plan giving program right now. It's functioning. Every piece of mail that you send out, everything you talk about, every newsletter, it's all a plan giving idea because Mrs. Gottrocks may sit there and say, I'm going to give them $1,000, but the truth, the truth is I really love this institution and I'm going to my attorney next week and they're going in my will. All right, so don't, don't fret if you don't have a plan giving program that's the most sophisticated in the country. You can do a little bit more and help yourself. That's another topic another time. But anyway, so I'm holding this up as a, as a good example of a, what I find to be a really nice plan for a mid-level shop. All right, now look at that other little piece of paper you've got. Now I've got to give you a little background about this. This is about the simplest that you're going to run into, okay? This is my annual plan in 2009 for the Cradle of Forestry Interpretive Association. No, actually, the full name is the Cradle of Forestry in America Interpretive Association. Now, it's a nonprofit over in Brevard, and guess what the, the uh, annual budget is? $500,000, maybe $600,000. $2.5 million. All right? It's a relatively large nonprofit. Okay? Now, I was talking to Dan Leroy before, before uh, I started today, and I said I was going to talk about this. Some of you are executive directors, and one of the things that those of you who are executive directors or would like to be executive directors are going to find out is that when you interview and you talk to the board and you do all your research, you're going to know no more than 25% of what's really there. Okay? I, I got told things like, well, we have a $2.5 million budget, and we've got a million dollars in the bank. That's great. When I got in there, I found out we had a $2.5 million budget and we were losing $250,000 a year. All right. And guess when this was that I took this place over? Ready? April of 2007. Oh, good. And they said, well, we don't know how to raise money. If anybody can, Comfort can. So we'll bring him in as executive director. We'll raise lots and lots of dough. The Cradle of Forestry is a wonderful place out near the parkway. It's a federal institution. Are you paying your taxes? Do you want to give me a big gift? No, you don't. <laughs> Comfort couldn't do it either. But anyway, he tried. So in 2009, this was my plan. 
So take a look at it. On the left hand, I've got my case items, all right, the things I'm going to try and raise money for. All right, how am I going to do this? Number one, I'm going to get a crowbar and try and get a gift out of my board. All right? You know what? What? Really? Why? Because I'm on the board? Nobody said anything about fundraising to me about making a gift. I'd give you my time. And my great name you can put on your letterhead. All right, you all know this. So anyway, the first thing I was doing was getting a, getting a gift out of the board. Then there were programs that they put on the summer. Good programs. I made myself a little brochure. It was a pretty good brochure. And I went out to tell people, I'd like you to sponsor my programs in the summer. Eh, right. Okay. So, I wanted $25,000 out of that. I got some money out of it. One $25,000. Anyway, I had a member, a group of members. That was my next one. So, uh, I, I was going to approach my members and do my membership thing. In June, we were going to do a special event. Yay, a run or a bike ride. Now, let me explain something to you. If you want to say the Biltmore State is where the Cradle of Forestry started, so therefore they should be helpful to us, as I thought, then you might want to do a bike race between the Biltmore Estate up the parkway to the Cradle of Forestry and back down. Good idea? Everybody with me so far? There are six separate agencies including the Forest Service and the U.S. Park Service, who don't get along all that well, who have to agree. The town of Biltmore Forest, the Biltmore Estate, I'm up to four, I forgot what the other two were. I got all six to agree. How am I doing? All right, this took months of work. They all agreed. You remember that rock slide on the parkway? <laughs> That was the end of that. Okay, so, love those special events. All right, so, the other special event I had was going to be a, a lunch for my donors as I was going to spend some money on it, and hopefully the few of them would write me checks. We did that, they did, that was fine. Then I had my annual donor appeal in September, and that was, so I was going to send it out in September, and then you see the second letter to go out. Now, just to run back to the top, I'll come back to the major gifts in a minute, but just run up to the top. Obviously, there's no problem about which staff member's involved because there's only one, all right? So uh, the time frame I put down, like first one was January, go beat them up in January, get their gift. I had a goal of $7,500. That's reasonable, a little stretch goal there for me. Ways to solicit, letter, phone, and visit. All right, everybody with me so far? Now, I'm putting down everything that should tell everybody what I'm doing. Number of prospects. Guess how many members there were on the board? 15, thank you very much. You all ought to go to some fundraising school. All right, so I had 15 prospects. Now the last column I want to talk about. The last column is what I call contacts. Now, one of the things I would honestly like all of you to do is to start thinking about your fundraising career and your successes not only in terms of the bottom line, but also in the contacts that you have with somebody. That can be a personal visit, you can go to coffee with somebody, you can have a, a conversation over the phone. Now, not about the weather, but if you're talking about your agency and what you're doing and your fundraising program, that's a contact. And then you fill out a contact report afterwards. Remember how computers were going to take all the paper out of your life? No, they didn't. But you put this both in Razor's Edge or whatever donor, donor software you're using, and you start tracking your contacts. Why? Because it may save your job. It may be very important for you to be able to say, I've talked to this many people. It also is helpful when I go to see Mike Smith, have lunch with Mike Smith in September, and I don't see him again because he's traveling all the time until next April, and I go back to my little paper contact report, and you can just come up with a form after your contact report, by the way, and I pull it out and it says, you know, one of his kids, I'm using it, I don't know, but, but something about Mike that I, or maybe his family that I'd forgotten. All right, these contact reports are very important to do and you need to track them on your basic annual plan because it's going to tell your donors what you're doing. 
Okay, well, I feel strongly about that. Now that you've listened to that, thank you very much. So, anyway, then I've got a goal down for each one of these things. I've got some ways to solicit, and that's going to be what I actually do, the number of prospects I expect to have to go see or have contact with in order to meet my goal, and then the actual number of contacts. So, for example, when I get down to the annual donor appeal, I'm going to send the letter out to my entire mailing list of interested donor prospects of 250 people. And um, hopefully, you know, I may actually call up or go see or something about 20 of them to get, part, get this goal. All right, so I'm listing both there. All right, now, remember I told you that you needed some major gift stuff to, to help upgrade gifts and that sort of thing. We had two major things going on, and I won't tell you the long, sad story of both. Actually, they're both really very successful. One was a campaign for a roof for the outdoor amphitheater. Now, if you go to the Cradle of Forestry, and I hope you all do, it's up from Sliding Rock on 280 in Pisgah Forest. It's where the first college in forestry was in the United States. You know, Columbia started two weeks after Carl Schenck started his school. It's a fascinating story. Lots of the old buildings there, three miles of paved trails, lots of stuff in there. You won't believe it if you haven't been up there. But anyway, so they took me out there in April of 2007 and said, we need a roof over our outdoor amphitheater, beautiful little outdoor amphitheater. I said, why? They said, well, my summer it's so hot, we can't have the kids sitting out there. And then if it rains, we've got to go inside, and we can have 400 people here at the outdoor amphitheater, and we've got room for 100 inside. Oh, okay, so you need a roof. They said, but it has to be a water permeable roof. You heard that right. I said, what is a water permeable roof? And they said, well, it's a roof that's made out of, you know, thatch or something like that. And so I said, I'm going to be sitting under the, the roof and my umbrella up. And they said, well, it's not too bad. I said, what are you talking about? So anyway, believe it or not, I said, look, I'll get you a roof, but it won't be a water permeable roof. Well, then we're going to have a fight with the Fish and Wildlife Service. They also don't get along with the Fish and Wildlife Service. <laughs> so anyway, one thing led to another. We finally have a roof up out there. All right, I won't tell you the rest of the story. But uh, if you go out there, you'll see a little boxy roof over it. So at least they can get 200 people out of the rain. Um, then they said, we have an old movie, a very old movie. And we need a new movie. And I said, well, let's get a new movie. Uh, Blue Ridge National Heritage Association. Area Partnership. Area Partnership, thank you very much, was a major sponsor for our roof. Thank you very much. I spent six months, if you go out there, you got to see my movie, all right? <laughs> I am the executive producer forever on the movie. <laughs> and it's really quite a good movie. But the truth is, we needed, it was a $350,000 movie, and we paid total about $50,000 for it. Lots of in-kind donations. But anyway, those, are, those were my major items that year. Okay? It's all here. All right? Is it a beautiful format like the other one? No. Is it just on my little Excel spreadsheet that I can manage? Yes. Does it tell the story? Yes. Is, is it equal to the financial donor strength of my institution, if it's long as it's cheap paper that it's on. Okay? But down at the in the bottom or on the on the left, I'll also put in bold what the cost of each of those items are. And uh, then I've got the total cost or the total goal of all my things, 113,250, amount that's actually going to go to the Cradle of Forestry in America Interpretive Association, because my board was very interested in that. And uh, so it comes out to 58250 so amount that goes into capital, $55,000. My cost of doing all this is 12500 and the net is 100750 and the CA, CFAIA will net 45750 okay? Well, that was about right, and that was about what I could do out there. So I felt really good about it when we got done. Now, the reason I'm telling you all this is to say You've now got to think about what it is that works for you. You've got to think about the case items that you have. You've got to think about the cost. And you've got to figure out how you want to lay it out. Amanda Edwards gave me her, her uh, she's another one she'll probably be willing to share with you, her annual plan. Amanda has both an executive director plan and a fundraising plan. All right? And they're 
very long and rather complicated. And so, guess who the only fundraiser is? Amanda Edwards. All right, she's doing all this herself. But again, it's important to lay it all out. Number one, it helps keep you on track. And then the second thing is it lets your board members, your staff members, your, your donors if appropriate, and um, your boss know what you're doing. Okay? Let me stop you and see if you have any questions now. What? Ten minutes and then I shut up? How about I shut up now? <laughs> okay, the, the, uh, again, what I've given you in terms of your examples are about the simplest way you can do it to a rather complex way to do it. But the important thing for you is to figure out what works. Get your volunteer who's into graphic design to help you. You can make it prettier. Get somebody on the board who, who really is, is good at all this, and they can help you. But the point is, I, and I found this out, I needed it because I was doing so many other things. I kept that one page right by my phone. Every day I had to look at it, and I had to think, well, what have I haven't done today? Now, I'll tell you one other thing that I did that I didn't put down, and that is I didn't put down my handful of major donors that I had. And I had a $25,000 donor who was helping us, and I would, every year I would go to visit her. Happiest rich person I've ever known in my life. Known a lot of unhappy rich people. But anyway, wonderful, happy person up in the main line in Philadelphia, outside of Philadelphia. And she'd give me $25,000 a year. Now, when I'm closing that deficit of $250,000, you can imagine what I had to do in that economy. I had to let people go. I had to curtail a lot of the programs that we did. I had to um, uh, come up with an earned income strategy. What I found out is that there was, a, there was another federal institution that needed an agency to run its operations for them. So I did a little bit. My treasurer did a little bit. My, my project, my, uh, my, or my uh, interpreter, my nature person did a little bit. It didn't bother any of us. And we got a contract signed with them for $26,000 a year. Now that's not a lot of money, but it's 10% of the, the goal I'm trying to, to uh, cover. And it's more than my biggest donor gave. And so we would run their, their convention for them and do their finances for them. And you know what? When we started doing then, that, other people in the Forest Service found out we were doing it, I started getting phone calls. Would you put on a weekend uh, convention for our, for our uh, you know, forestry nonprofit or for my forestry group that I've never heard of? And I said, sure. It cost you 8,000 bucks. It cost you 11,000 bucks. Pretty soon we were in the, in the convention business, all right? We did as much as we could handle, but when you need $250,000 and you can put 40 of it into earned income, that's a nice chunk right there. So the, uh, the reason I keep bringing that up is to remind you all to keep looking for those things because there might be something else that, that may, may come to you. Scott Buchanan, when he talked to us, talked about his estate plan, this sort of thing. What, he, what I wish he'd spend a little more time on is if you heard him, he glossed through pretty quickly, and since we had the trucks, we were able to do this, and then that, and then the other thing. It led to several other things he was doing, just because it fit with, with his mission. Folks, we want to do our mission. We don't want to do these other things. And when I was director of development of Covenant House in New Orleans, the local pizza guy, when I went and asked him for $10,000, he said, I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll do better than that, I'll give you a pizza hut. You got 100 street kids living in your facility every night? Let's see, they're all drug dealers and prostitutes and crooks. Let's run a pizza hut. Sounds like a good idea to me. You know, I'm sorry, I didn't want to do pizza on Christmas Day, because it would have been me. And I turned him down, and he got mad. And he didn't give me $10,000, he didn't give me anything. Sometimes you gotta say no to some of these things and just press on. But, but what I'm saying is use your development plan to get your board involved in something different and think about what you might be able to do that you're not doing now. And yes, there's going to be a board member who says, Alex, we've got to start raising endowment and we've got to get into plan giving. In my experience, that comment is often, don't come to me looking for a big gift. 
Now, yes, we all do, do need to do all five things, but we don't have the capacity to do all five things. Remember when you start doing your annual plan, you may need to go to your board and your executive director and say, we can see our way clear to doing X if we get the support financially to grow the development staff. Because if you just give in and say, sure, we can add that to our plate, you're cruising for a bruise. We kemosabe. <laughs> Lloyd just says, we kemosabe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I, I, you know, I'm, I'm out of time now, but what I want to tell you is that this is not something that is just optional. And again, at the bottom of my little sheet, I put in bold, number of yearly contacts, 175. That's what it added up to. So if I could go to my boss and my board, which I did, and say, here's the plan, here's what I did, here's how many contacts I've, ma I've managed to have, and here's what the results were, and they weren't as high as I'd hoped, but they were still okay, they will say, we agree. All right, I'm, no, I'm going to stop now and ask you if you've got questions. Alex? Yes. Um, how do you overlay a campaign with these five categories? I'd go back to the question is how do you o overlay a capital campaign in the midst of this? Then what you do is, depending on the year, Let's say, go, go back to Pardee's thing, you know, you'd add one more column for the campaign. You'd, in mine at the Cradle of Forestry, I'd have one more line at the bottom. And I'd say, how much I'm, how much I'm, what my goal is for this year, who's going to be involved in it, and uh, put the rest of the information in. It's just exactly what you do. You might not have a separate major gift piece for them that year. Your campaign is your major gift piece. Good question. Anybody else? All right. Um, at this point, generally, Amanda steps up and says, uh, so glad that you came today. Next week, we're, or next month at this time, we're going to have Ann Manor McClarty talk about donor stewardship with her nationally known program, with her nationally known company, that resides in Burnsville, North Carolina, believe it or not. And she's going to share with us the latest and greatest things about how to recognize our donors, how to make sure we have a program that does stewardship in an ongoing way, and it's something you really don't want to miss. Amanda? <laughs> okay, I, I will tell you as, a, as past president of AFP, it's really exciting to have so many people here today and to have so many people who are uh, visitors and there's nothing more important than our, um, to my mind, to my fundraising career than being a member of AMP. Not a single thing. I hate lapel pins and I've got one here that says 25 years in AFP and Mark has just reminded me that if you have a, an idea for a program that you haven't gotten to Amanda, please see her after the meeting. Is there anything else? Yes. Okay. Four Seasons Hospice is featured in this month's philanthropy, Advancing Philanthropy magazine. So if you're not a member, you're going to miss it. But if you're a member, it's in this month's uh, issue of the magazine. Yeah, and you get that both online and a paper version. It's great. Let's give Alex a round of applause for his paper. Not my gift. Um, thank you again for coming. Um, real quick, because I know we all got to go because we have real jobs elsewhere we got to get to. If you're a board member, would you stand up real quick? This is this year's board for AFP. Any of these people can help you if you have a question about membership, about a program, about gee, why aren't we doing this, or gee, I have a great idea for that. Please see one of these people and they'll be happy to help you. And again, thank you so much for coming today. Drive safe on your way.